Thank you all for being here. My name is Ray. Uh, this is my first time to be at the Toronto Jog as well. Um, and thank you all for coming. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, gRPC and uh, how you can use it to uh, create uh, your microservices and uh, the key differences uh, and benefits of it. Um, so I'm a developer advocate. I'm actually based in New York City, so it's not too far away for me to come here, which is awesome. I love to uh, travel quite a bit. Uh, but um, you know, again, I like to uh, come to the East Coast uh, cities uh, quite a bit as well. Uh, I do work for the Google Cloud Platform. What that means is I tend to bring some of the latest and greatest technology uh, from Google in general to developers all over the world, uh, specifically uh, Java developers. I've been a Java developer myself for the past uh, 10 plus years, uh, being in the industry for just as long, and um, it's my go-to language. You can find me on Twitter. That's probably the easiest way to find me to uh, you know, ask any questions, and also uh, give me any feedbacks about the technology that you learned today. Uh, if you don't like this session, uh, if you have uh, bad things to say, you can uh, find me on Google+, because I never use it. <laughs> and neither do you, I know. <laughs> I'm scared, oh, wait, this is recorded, right? Shoot. <laughs> but anyways, uh, you can also email me, but um, seriously, like, the Twitter is probably the easiest way, and I always respond to, uh, to, to Twitter uh, very, very quickly. All right. Uh, just very high level, uh, Google Cloud, if you're not familiar with it, you can chat with me afterwards if you'd like to learn more. Uh, bottom line is we have everything from infrastructure to platform as a service and big data and machine learning, blah, blah, blah. All right, I'm going to skip over that. Anyways, uh, quick show of hand. I heard that many people are using microservices. How many people are actually implementing microservices today? Wow, half the room. How many people are looking to, looking to implement it in the future? Okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. So... That seems to be the trend. I'm not going to go into the whys and the hows and you know, the theories or you know, all, all those other things on whether you should or should not use microservices. But if you have decided that's what you need, that solves your problem, uh, there are two things to consider, right? Two very important things to consider. Uh, number one is that as you're breaking down your application into multiple microservices, uh, one of the, the first things that you're going to realize is, uh, hold on a second, you know, rather than just having one app, and deploy just one app you know, multiple times, now you got three, four, five different services you have to deploy. And of course, you don't run one instance of each, right? because that wouldn't be HA. So if you have five services, then you got 10 instances you have to manage at the very least. So then you run into management issues and how do you actually deal with the deployment and management of these applications. And now we have a lot of technology that can help you with it, right? Any, anywhere from a platform as a service with Cloud Foundry or OpenShift, or uh, just you go straight to containers with container orchestration like Kubernetes. Uh, we can do a lot of these management that we couldn't do before uh, when I was, say, doing my SOA implementation five, you know, 10 years ago. Doesn't matter, like it, it just wasn't feasible at the time. So now we can manage instances at scale. However, what most people don't consider today is how are these services supposed to talk to each other? And when I say services talking to each other, I mean the backend services talking to other backend services. And the default choice today is, seems to be REST. I mean, REST is great. Uh, we, we make that conscious choice uh, years ago to move off of this other technology, uh, SOAP, right? And, um, and REST is very well understood, but it is also the default choice today. But um, I like to present, you know, just you have to consider other choices as well because, um, you know, just like the, I, how many people here actually went through the SOA implementations? Anyone? Anyone went through SOAP, right? Why, why did we go through SOAP? Because I think everybody else said we should be using SOAP, like, <laughs> right? Why are we using REST? Is it because everybody else is telling us we should be using REST, right? Uh, so you got to be conscious about, why are we choosing technologies to solve what type of problems? And they all have different problems that they can solve uh, very well, whether it's RPC or SOAP. But when we talk about RPC, uh, to some of us, this is actually very familiar. Uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, specifically, most memorable, my favorite, is Korba. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's not my favorite. How many, how many people went through Korba days? Yeah, there's always, you know, half of the room probably went through Korba. For those of you who have not seen Korba, I, I found this really, really good tutorial. If I ever need to do Korba again, this is the, the page I will go to. It's a really good tutorial, right? It's very detailed. It takes you step to step. 
basically with most of the uh, RPC frameworks, right, it doesn't matter what it is, usually it follows the same patterns. Number one is you have some kind of ADL. You have an interface definition language. Because with RPC, we need to define the message payloads and the operations very explicitly so that we can actually generate uh, the code that corresponds to this service. So you can either implement or that you can just use to call uh, from the client. Right? So the very first thing is you need the IDL that defines what the, the service needs to do. In this case, uh, in this example, right, this, this person writes a really good example. In this example, uh, they just want to add two numbers together. Right? Just addition operation to add two numbers together. Once you have the IDL in most of the RPC systems, what you can also do is to generate the stops so that you can just implement, you can uh, override some methods, and so you can just implement the behaviors on the server side um, and return the result that you want. And again, this is a core by example uh, on the server side where you actually just add two numbers together. So you implement this add method and you just add two numbers together. Very easy to do. And then the next thing you need to do is to, you know, call it from a client. The beauty of RPC is that mostly, in most cases, the clients will be generated for you. So you don't have to write your own client ever again. Uh, unlike REST, where you potentially have to figure out the schema yourself and just make sure you're passing the right JSON objects and maybe make a few mistakes here and there, uh, with RPC, they're all generated for you, okay? So in Corba, however, uh, to make that call, uh, <laughs> It's quite a lot of code. It goes on forever. And you know, just let me remind you, this is just adding two numbers together, all right? And <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what they do, right? So anyways, this is probably why RPC has been out of fashion for a while. Uh, it was too complicated to do. Um, and also because we were actually, RPC in general was trying to map like a server namespace to a local namespace, right? or a server memory space to the, the local names, uh, memory space. And that turned out to be the bad thing about RPC in the past. Um, and then there we have other things, right? DCOM and uh, RMI. RMI is my Java favorite. It's really, really easy to use, really easy to implement. Uh, however, it is not exactly interoperable, right? You, when you implement something with RMI, you can only make a calls from RMI too. Uh, if you ever want to use Python or Node, well, that's too bad. And then so uh, somebody had a brilliant idea of using XML to, uh, to be the interchange format and uh, came up with the SOAP standards and WSDOs and all that stuff, right? And why do I talk about SOAP? Well, in SOAP, you actually have two styles of SOAP. I don't know if anyone noticed it. You have document SOAP or document style SOAP. And you have RPC style SOAP, right? And depending on what you do, you could do things more like REST or you can do things more like RPC. And, um, and people use SOAP to do RPC. And even today, um, a lot of people are using REST. However, there's something with REST that you need to consider. Well, number one, it's that um, it is definitely loosely coupled, but uh, in such a way that you know, the, the schemas is really hard to define. Now we have Swagger to help you with it, but in general, it's very easy to make mistakes when you are trying to uh, send through the payload. Um, and it's, usually it's not strongly typed. You just don't know what people are gonna be sending over the wire. Uh, but also that when you're using REST, if you're using strict, strict REST, what that means is you are stuck with the semantics of the HTTP verbs, right? The, the post, the put, uh, the deletes, and patch, and so on and so forth. And these matches really, really well with CRUD operations, the creation, the retrievals, and all that, over a resource, over an op, um, entity of some sort. However, what that also means is that if you ever have a more complicated business logic that you want to expose remotely, you cannot really do that over easily over REST. Uh, for example, if I want to take uh, money between um, um, somebody's account uh, and transfer it to mine, well, what do I do in REST? Well, do I patch one of the accounts and deduct the money? And then over the wire somehow in my memory space, I do another patch to another resource over the wire. Now how do I deal with transaction? How do I deal with these more complicated business processes? It's really hard to do over strict RESTful semantics. That's why people also came up with JSON RPC, or in many cases, REST is actually not no, strict REST. It's actually just another RPC type of deal. So, there's a space for RPC, uh, especially from the service-to-service -service communication perspective. And it can only be good if it's simple to use, not like the example that we saw earlier, 
and also interoperable. Um, so simple as RMI, but more interoperable than that, right? And also very efficient. At Google, we actually have microservices everywhere, and uh, we use our internal framework called Stubby to make RPC calls. This is what we use for all of our microservices communication. And we actually make 10 to the 10 RPC calls per second today, and that is significant in our data center. Now just imagine if this is something that's not efficient enough, if just every call, if it just takes one extra byte than necessary, what that means is we're gonna be spending 10 to the 10 more bytes per second uh, that's unnecessary just to make RPC calls. So Stubby was really made to be very efficient uh, to operate at scale uh, within our environment. And that essentially turned into gRPC. gRPC is the open source version of Stubby that was collaborated on by another company called Square. Uh, we actually open sourced the project together. Uh, the G in gRPC does not stand for any company I know of. It doesn't. <laughs> Just saying. Uh, like, do not think this is Google RPC. gRPC is actually a recursive acronym. Uh, it's actually gRPC Remote Procedural Code Framework. That's exactly what it is. It was definitely designed to be simple and idiomatic, uh, designed to be performant and interoperable. I'll show you how that works. It's actually based on very basic technology that's been around for a while and some new things, uh, specifically for the serialization for the payload. Uh, by default, it uses Proto Buffer 3. Okay. To define a gRPC service, we also use Proto Buffer 3 to define the service itself, and that's used as the IDL, that's used as the interface definition language. However, gRPC does not operate over its own TCP protocol of some sort. Uh, we actually operate over HTTP2. So if you think about JSON RPC or REST as something that, uh, that, that uses JSON serialization format over HTTP1, well, gRPC is literally put up over three over HTTP2, okay? How many people here actually have used HTTP2 already or is a little bit familiar with it? Yeah, well, well a few. Um, well, actually, if you ever use Chrome and you, if you ever visit Google.com, uh, you're probably already using HTTP2 without even knowing it. Uh, that is because um, it's a core, it's still a HTTP protocol. It's actually a binary protocol, so unlike HTTP 1, where everything is transferred over text and plain text, in HTTP 2, everything is encoded in binary, okay? So in HTTP 1, when you wanna do a get or a put method, you actually send those texts in binary, uh, sorry, in ASCII, you send it over the wire, that will be three bytes just to send a get request, at the very least, to send a get word, in HTTP2, it's just one byte to indicate whether it's a, a get operation or a put operation. Uh, in HTTP1 1 and 1.1, 1 .1, they have other issues. Um, for example, uh, in HTTP1, there's no pipelining. What that means is when you wanna make multiple requests, you actually have to open up multiple connections in order, in order to make multiple requests in parallel, okay? If you don't, then you have to wait for each of the requests to complete before you can make another request, right? In HTTP 1.1, they kind of solve this problem by using pipelining, so you can actually make multiple requests over the same connection, the same HTTP connection. Um, however, you do run into some issues. If one of these requests is taking longer time to respond, no other responses can be sent back, and this is known as a head of line blocking uh, problem in HTTP 1.1. <laughs> so there are some inefficiencies in the HTTP 1 protocol. And Google actually realizes this, and we, we actually work on something called uh, Speedy uh, in the past. That's the, the protocol that we kind of in developed internally. And that turned out to be uh, now opened up and known as HTTP2. So we solved a lot of the inefficiency issues in HTTP1. Um, the other thing that we solved is to be able to, um, what we call uh, multiplexing, uh, multiple requests over the same stream so that you don't have this type of head of line blocking issue. And the way that we do it in HTTP2 is by chunking the request and response into smaller pieces. So imagine, imagine you're operating at the TCP level where you're sending packets, right? Packets is what you can use to, what you can, like if you have a large chunk of text, it will be split up into multiple packets and we can do uh, traffic management over individual packets, right? In, when you operate a higher capacity in HTTP protocol, uh, in the past, there's no flow control in HTTP 1. Now we can actually do flow control over HTTP 2 because we actually split up uh, the, the data payload into multiple chunks, and these chunks are called the data frames. 
And because of this, we can actually multiplex multiple requests uh, over the same connection, all right? And these connections are more persistent. Moreover, we can also use a streaming in HTTP2 now, right? If you ever try to do streaming in HTTP1, what do you do? You probably go straight to WebSocket, right? Or if you really want to stick with HTTP, then we use a server sent event, right, SSE. But in both cases, they have their downsides. In HTTP2, streaming is actually native. What that means is you can actually stream from server to the client natively. You can also stream from the client to the server natively as well. And you can also do bi-directional streaming as well. That is really cool because uh, if you're writing a front end, what that means is if you're making a request to a page, and this page you know for a fact that this page needs a CSS file and uh, you know, a few JPEGs, before the client even asks for it, the server can actually stream the data to the client before the client even asks for it, which is really cool. Okay? Uh, there are other things that we do uh, in HTTP2. For example, we compress the header. Uh, if you ever open up the header you know, in your browser uh, inspectors, when you see that network traffic, you'll probably be like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> like sometimes the header payload is actually larger than the, the content payload itself. Uh, in HTTP2, we actually compress the header. Uh, not only do we compress it into binary, but we also uh, only send the differentials, which is kind of nice, okay? So just to see and feel what HTTP2 looks like, uh, there's a really good demo site. Let me see how this works, the Wi-Fi works here. All right, so, so on the left, uh, this is actually loading a uh, HTTP1, um, over HTTP1, and these are just different image tiles, okay? So these are loading multiple image tiles. There's no caching uh, over HTTP1 connection. And uh, this is HTTP2 for exactly the same images without any caching either, right? And the key here is that um, it, rather than opening up multiple connections and being blocked by head offline uh, in HTTP2, it's just multiple strings multiplexed over the same connection. And this is the technology that gRPC is based on, all right? Is the server sending Uh, in this case, uh, no. In this case, no. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. So, yeah, well, this one is, uh, is a little bit different. <laughs> I think they slowed this down on purpose. No, just kidding. <laughs> but so how fast is gRPC, right? Well, of course, of course, you would expect binary protocol to be faster than a text-based protocol. right? I think that's a given. I wouldn't be here... Uh, if uh, binary is slower than text, it just doesn't make any sense, right? But how much faster? Well, the throughput is definitely faster, but I think what's more interesting is how much faster or how much throughput you can gain per CPU. This is actually important because if you're going for cloud native, you're actually deploying in the cloud, you pay for the CPUs, right? As a cloud provider, I probably want you to use more, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, as a cloud <laughs> provider, <laughs> I'm telling you to use the CPU as efficiently as possible, all right? But this is also really, really important if you have any uh, mobile workload. Uh, mobile devices where its CPUs is not infinite, right? You actually gain a lot more by using a binary protocol over a text protocol. Uh, spe specifically uh, with gRPC, you actually get a lot more performance out of it. But not only that, think about all the, the, the connections and um, the payload sizes, right? So what that also means is you get uh, lower latency, you get faster responses, and you can actually stream data. What that also means is more responsive UI front end as well. So rather than waiting for everything to come back, you can just stream data as they arrive and piece by piece, and you can construct your UI progressively. All right. And last thing before I jump into my demo, uh, like I said, with most of the RPC system, you start off with the IDL, and then we can generate uh, code for different languages. In gRPC, we officially support these languages. There are other languages you can use gRPC with. It's just not an officially supported thing, but there are community support around it. But I want, I want you to focus on just three of them, uh, specifically uh, Objective-C, C Sharp, and Java. Uh, that is because these are actually mostly used for, web, uh, for um, mobile development, right? So you can actually use gRPC on the client side on mobile as well. All right, so let's see it. Let's see uh, what the gRPC looks like and how you can actually get started. I'm gonna do some coding here. Uh, hopefully everything works. Uh, live coding is not my forte, so let me give it a try. All right, I got, I got time here. So I have a little project set up here. I have a simple gRPC server. 
uh, I have a main class. I got nothing in there, uh, just a main method. I'm going to implement the server, and I'm going to implement the client. Um, I'm going to refer to the Cobalt tutorial on and off uh, to see how I can do this, all right? <laughs> all right, the first thing we need to do is to define the IDL. Uh, with the IDL, we need to define the message payload and the RPC operation, okay? So to define this, we got to use a portal file. That is the IDL we need to uh, work with, uh, with the portal buffer three language. And so first of all, I need to make sure that I'm actually, in fact, using portal buffer three syntax because we have portal buffer two, uh, I don't know what happened to portal buffer one. I never seen it. Uh, but just to be sure, you need to set it to portal buffer three. Okay? Just like in Java, you have the concept of packages. Same thing in gRPC. In fact, uh, whatever that we specify as a package here will actually ultimately be generated into the corresponding package in Java. So here I can say um, packages example. There will be a compiler, what we call a proto compiler or protogen, or a generator. It, either, it has many, many different names. What it does is that it will actually take this file, this proto file, and convert it into the target language, okay? When it does this generation, you can actually um, set a few settings or different options, right, when you generate the target language uh, artifacts. So for Java, for example, by default, it's going to generate everything into a single Java file. And I hate that, so I don't like to do it that way. So what I do is I set the option. I can say uh, Java multiple files is equal to true. And what I will do is to tell the generator that when you generate these messages and these Java files, these classes, just make sure they are in their individual files, okay? So once you've done the initial setup, then you can actually define the message payload. Um, if you're using REST, you probably do this via Swagger or something to specify the, the contract between the, the services. Well, here you can just uh, specify the message payload with the keyword message. I can say hello request, for example, and that will be my payload object, okay? And then I can specify all the attributes within it. Uh, it is strongly typed, it's type safe. So you start out with the type and you give it the name of the field. So first name, can I type, yeah, equal one, and uh, last name is equal to two. Now, this is actually quite important. Uh, the name of the field, it's actually a logical thing, right? It's, um, it's, you can actually change the name of the field without, having, without changing the semantics of this, uh, of this uh, uh, message payload. The reason for that is because over the wire, uh, where JSON actually passes first name as the, 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 the field name, right? With every message payload, in proto buffer three in gRPC, we actually pass the number. And this number is called a tag. So we use the tag number to indicate, to uniquely identify what field uh, this value is associated with. And as long as you're using the same tag number within the message payload, it actually doesn't matter what you call it uh, in, uh, for the name, right? So I can change this name later if I want to. It doesn't matter because the tag name is the same, okay? Um, <clears throat> Then what we can do is uh, we, ha we have other types as well. So I'm gonna put age in there. Uh, we can also, oh, I gotta give it a tag. Forget that sometimes. Uh, if you have a list of things you wanna return, like a uh, array list or something, you can do repeated. So you can say repeated string hobbies, for example. I'm gonna call it four. Uh, we can also do strongly typed maps, which is nice. We have strongly typed key and value, just like in Java with the angular, uh, with the angular thingy. Uh, to specify a, a map type, right? So we can call it five. And just like in Java, we have enumerations. Uh, we have that in gRPC too. I'm gonna call this sentiment. That's how you're feeling right now. Uh, probably not so happy, so I feel happy, so I'm gonna say happy is equal to zero, all right? Uh, a little sleepy, maybe? I hope not, but uh, I, drunk. <laughs> well, for the very first time in my talk, I'm gonna put drunk in here. <laughs> well, you could be very angry at me at the very end of it, so uh, I'm gonna put angry here. Angry drunk. <laughs> angry drunk. <laughs> well, just for you, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you see, you see, like, you can actually, oh shoot, what just happened? Undo, in, undo IntelliJ, what just happened, IntelliJ? What? See, and look what you made me do. Look what you made IntelliJ do. You made IntelliJ drunk and angry. <laughs> what just happened? What, what, what is going on? What? 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 Whoa. 
Well, I cannot type anymore. Oh, shoot. All right. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Yeah, so my keyboard was drunk and angry. All right. <laughs> this is recorded, right? This is going to be the most drunk talk I've ever given. All right, let's continue. <laughs> All right, so once you define, ooh, once you define the enumeration, let me get back to this. All right, you can use it just like any other type. All right, let's, let's slow down a little bit. I'm going to slow down. Let me take a drink. Wow. All right, this is fun. I like it here. I need to come back here again. <laughs> What's that? Where? My map does, oh, yes, you're right. I, no, no, that is definitely not OK. This is just, uh, this is just a drunk and uh, angry uh, keyboard right here. Back, back of tricks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to call it back of tricks. And live coding is definitely not my back of tricks here. All right, let's continue. <laughs> good catch, good catch. All right. Whew, slow down. Response. You, need to, you have to define the response type as well. Even if you don't have any response, you still have to define the response type that has nothing in it. It doesn't matter, right? But uh, I'm going to put something in there. I'm going to say uh, greeting is equal to 1. Yeah, OK, good. So now I have to request a response type. Then I can actually define what my service looks like. And so you can say uh, you, can code, uh, you can create a new service. I'm going to call it uh, the uh, greeting service. And in the service, you can define operations. RPC operations, you just think about these as methods that you, you have in the class, right? So I'm going to say uh, this is greet, and I'm going to take in the request, and I'm going to return the <coughs> response, OK? And that's, that's really it. You can, of course, have multiple requests and responses here as well. And this is what we call a unitary request. Uh, that is because you're only sending one request, and you're expecting one response. If you ever need to string, multiple responses back to the client. Imagine if you're looking at database lookup, you got you know, pagination, you, you have like 20 or 100 things you need to send back to the client. Well, you can actually do uh, streaming if you want to. You can stream the responses back. All you have to do is to add a string to the return type. Now you have server-side streaming. If you need to stream data from the client to the server, imagine if you have an IoT device that's streaming uh, metrics continuously, then you add string to the request, and that's it. If you want to do bidirectional streaming, then you stream both ways. You just add both stream uh, to, um, to the uh, signature, OK? So I'm going to start off uh, easy, given that I'm a little angry and drunk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with a simple case right now. <laughs> I'm going to just do the, the unitary request, OK? The next thing we need to do is to actually turn this into Java file. And uh, to do that, we actually have to download the proto generator. You have to run the generator. And then uh, out comes the Java file. Uh, we made this really, really easy for people to do in Java, uh, particularly uh, with Maven and Gradle. You, we have plugins for you, uh, so it's really easy. Okay? How many people here use Gradle? So I want to see if you all can. Oh, OK, it's usually half. OK, pretty good. Maven? All right, all right. I see some people who didn't raise hand. Ant? Ant? No? No, make. still not. Make, <laughs> make. yes. I, I got make right here. Yes, I got make as well. All right. So regardless of what you use, uh, we always have something for you. So let me see. Uh, you can just go to GitHub. This is the gRPC GitHub. gRPC, gRPC Java. If you scroll down to the README, you're going to see what we are going to, well, you can just copy and paste. So in this case, I'm going to add in the dependencies. All right. So dependencies, uh, we got the gRPC dependencies. And then, uh, if you're using Gradle, uh, this is what you do to use the plugin. Uh, I'm using Maven, so I got to deal with XML here. All right. So first of all, I'll explain what these are in a second. I'm just going to copy and paste it in first. Okay. So two plugins we need to add. All right. Here we go. All right. So the first plugin here. This is actually a plugin that can detect your operating system. Okay. The reason we need to know what operating system and architecture that we're running the build on is because the proto generator is a native binary. So we actually need to know whether you're using Mac or if you're using Windows. We need to know what this is first, and then we can pass it to the next plugin so that we can actually download the right executables. Okay. So rather than having you downloading all the generator yourself, we just download it directly from the plugin. And the plugin needs to know what operating system you're running on. That's why you need this very first plugin uh, at the beginning. Okay? 
Um, but then the beauty of it is you can also tie this in, of course, into the build phases, right? So whenever you compile the code, we'll also run this generator uh, so, so your code will compile uh, completely. Okay, so that should be it, I hope. Uh, let me just uh, try this out. I'm gonna do a Maven clean, just so I'm not cheating. There's nothing there, I'm gonna do a Maven package. All right, that's, that's a good sign. All right, so it went through this whole um, generation thing and um, in my target, I should have the generated sources. And in there, I can see portal buff. Uh, and there's GRPC Java. Oh, oh, there's nothing in there. That's not good. All right, I'll, I'll take a look at that later. Uh, example, oh. Oh, wait, oh, I know why. Let's get out of the heck out of here. LS, all right. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, there we go. There were no other directories. I'm like, why is it all empty? Let me take another drink, hold on a second. Wow, all right, so now you can see all the, all the file that's been generated. Man, live coding, this is tough. All right, so that's good, and that's all it takes to, uh, to, uh, to basically generate the server-side stuff, and also it generated the client too, it generated both in one shot, okay? So on the server-side, what do we do? Uh, first, we need to implement the, uh, the, the stuff that's been generated, so I can just go ahead and implement a new uh, greeting service input that extends a greeting service uh, Input base, okay? So that's the base class. And in this base class, we actually implement a default return value for the greeting method. And that return value is actually uh, not uh, something like uh, uh, operation not implemented. So it's an error, it actually throws an error. So we need to actually implement it so you can override the, the method and we can then return data back to the client. I wanna point out here though, this signature was not natural for me at the first, at the beginning. Why? Because, you know, remember we had a unitary request response. What that means is what we're accustomed to usually is that we would have the response type in the return value, right? And then we have greet, and then we have the request in the request parameter, right? That's how we usually used to think about how we define these services. But look at this one, this is a little bit different. All right, so we have the greet operation, we're taking the request in the parameter, but we also get this response observer. And this is actually a callback, fun, uh, callback interface. The reason that we're doing this is because by default, all of the server-side operations are asynchronous, right? This is asynchronous by default on the server-side. It is up to the client, it's up to the caller to decide whether the caller wants to block or not, right? So to capture all cases, we, and also for efficiency, everything here is actually async by default on the server side. So in order for you to return something to the, the client, you actually have to call response observer, and you're gonna call the onNext method. Now if you look closely here, if you're ever uh, familiar with RxJava or React, uh, reactive uh, stuff, right? Like you, you see the signature is on error, on next, on completed. This is actually uh, almost a direct mapping to all of the, the Rx stuff today, all right? And later I'll probably show you a little bit about how you can tie Rx Java together with gRPC, which will be pretty, pretty cool, all right? So I can go ahead and uh, say, let me go create an on next, or I'm gonna call on next, right? And I'm gonna give you a response. Uh, how do I get the response from? So I'm gonna say hello response. Now in, in gRPC and in portal buffer specifically, I hate to say it, but every object you want to create, you have to use a builder to create it. You don't use the new, you don't use the constructor, you use a builder. So in this case, you have to say hello response, new builder, right? You set the greeting method, uh, you, call the, you set the greeting attribute and you can say uh, something like hello, uh, blah, 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 request dot get, and as you can see, all the attribute strongly typed here um, with the right types in Java. And you can just pick one of them and say hello Ray. And I'm gonna build it. I'm gonna assign this to the response variable, and I can send the, send it back to the client. All right. I'm gonna use the best logger uh, that every Java developer lo likes, which is System out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna show you what the request looks like. All right. Um, we actually implement two strings, so you don't have to you know write your own. Uh, we actually print out the payload if you ever code the two string. All right. Are we done? Not quite. So here's the kicker. Um, because this is an asynchronous operation, 
And because this, this is actually a streaming interface, even though we define this to be a unitary request response, what that means is I'm only expecting one response, and I give it the one response, but you actually have to call the completion explicitly. So you actually have to physically call uncompleted. All right? if, you don't, if you don't call this, then the client will be hung forever. All right? Just keep this in mind. If you don't actually say response has been completed, then the client will keep on waiting for the response, even though in the definition we say we only want to have one response. It just, this is just how it works. Uh, it's not optimal, but uh, it is how it works. It's also very possible to make a mistake like code the on next twice, okay? In this case, we actually throw an arrow because we know that you only should response, return one response, but you code on next twice, then the condition is not the same, so we actually throw an error in this case. But this is a runtime exception. This is not caught at the compilation time. All right? So that's how you define and implement the, the server stop. And then we can actually you know, start the server. You, ha you actually have to write that out too. And for that, I got to go back to that core by example. Give me a second. I'm just kidding now. <laughs> <laughs> to, to use the server, you, you actually use, uh, you, you have to build a server object. And how do you do that? You use a builder, of course. So you, there's a server builder. You can listen to the port 8080 uh, and you can build it. And then to register this service implementation, you say add service and you can just give it a new instance of it, all right? And that's it. And I can assign this to the server variable. Uh, and then I can say server start. Now this is going to be starting the server in the background thread. And what that means is if you don't do anything to wait for the server, uh, this main method would just exit, right? It would just like gone, like, oh, background thread, forget it, just kill it, right? So we actually have to wait for the server uh, for it to terminate, and that's why you have to call server await termination. And there are other things you need to do to have a graceful shutdown, but this is the, the easiest way to get the server started, okay? Whew. All right, so how many people think this would just work? Wow, nobody. <laughs> Holy, wow, thank you. Now I got one fan right here. Damn. You buy us all drinks? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be a problem. I'm going to be asking this all night. You just, you just raise your hand. I'll be keeping track who's raising your hand. All right, so I'm going to say uh, exact Java. Let's see how this works. <clears throat> all right, that's, that's good. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, I'm just kidding. This actually works. <laughs> because I didn't print anything out. This is actually listening on port 8080 right now, okay? Now, the only way for me to find out whether this works or not is to actually implement the client. I'm not going to do that. My talk is over. So, yeah, time is up. Just kidding. All right, so let's go ahead and implement the client. <laughs> yeah, if it must work, that's right. No testing. I don't even need to test. I just know it works. I know. I know. Go straight to prod. Exactly. <laughs> yes, that's right. I do on production. That's awesome. <laughs> Best shirt. <laughs> All right, so to implement the client, it's very, very easy. First of all, we need to specify how we want to connect. Who do we want to connect to? And to do that, rather than having you to deal with the TCP connections or the HTTP connections, uh, we abstract everything away by a concept called channel, okay? And how do you create a channel? With a builder, of course. So you use a, ch a channel builder. You can say for target, I want to connect to my local host 8080, okay? Uh, because we're in Java, uh, I'm not going to deal with SSL today because that will take all night in Java, so I'm not, not doing that. <laughs> all right, and then I can build and all that, right? But just remember, uh, gRPC worked uh, with SSL out of the box, and uh, you can actually do mutual TLS to authenticate your services if you really want to, all right? Doesn't HTTP 2 require TLS? Uh, the strict HTTP 2, yes. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So in production, you should definitely use uh, SSL and TLS. Uh, but in in, in my case, I'm just going to use plain text for now, yeah? And, ah, so here's, here's a few interesting things in the channel. Uh, we actually abstract away the, the connection pooling for you. We also abstract away load balancing for you in the channel. What that means is if you ever, ever want to do client-side load balancing, you can actually specify your own client-side load balancer, okay? For client-side load balancing, you also need to know, you know, given a logical name, you need to map it to, um, you know, the actual endpoints. And for that, you need to give it a name resolver, okay? So for example, if you're using Eureka for your service discovery, then you gotta give it a Eureka name resolver. In most cases, you gotta write it yourself, okay? Eureka, Zookeeper, whatever, we have the example code on this, all right? So 
I'm going to do a build, and I'm going to create a, oh, sh what just happened? Wait, the IntelliJ just crashed on me? <laughs> what? How many people actually see IntelliJ crash? This is the second time. This is the second time this happened to me. <laughs> you guys, you see Eclipse. Now I move away from Eclipse because I didn't want to crash my ID ever again. All right. Wow. 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 So my IntelliJ is really drunk today. All right. That's for sure. I mean, <laughs> or yeah, <laughs> we're not drunk enough. So what am I doing here? What am I doing this? <laughs> oh, what the? Seriously? Wow. Wow. But luckily, yeah, this is pretty easy to do. Yeah, well, here we go. <laughs> Let me just check out for my, yeah. Next thing I know, my battery will be out of power. All right, here we go. <laughs> All right, cool. So, oh man, this is a tough night. All right, so you have the channel, then you can use the stop. You, you, you gotta give the channel to the stop, and the stop is actually generated for you. So you can say greeting service gRPC. You can say new stop. Now check it out. We actually have three different stops you can actually use. We have the blocking stop, the future stop, and just stop. Uh, that one just fully async, uh, so you deal with the callback. This one returns the future, and this one is just the blocking call. So again, it's up to the client on whether the call should be blocking or not. All right. So I'm gonna say this is a blocking stop. I'm gonna do the channel, pass it in, and I can call this a stop. Then I can stop dot greet. Uh, I can give it a request. I oh, not that one. Request uh, use the builder, of course and build, and I'm gonna set my first name, Ray, that I remember. Set my age, I'm gonna say 18. Yeah. All right. <laughs> You're not old enough to make a 19. Yeah. <laughs> oh, is that the legal ring age in here? Yeah, I thought it was 21. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can add my hobbies. Uh, <laughs> photography. <laughs> Oh, it's too funny. At hobby, yeah, not drinking. There we go. All right. Oh. <laughs> now let me do that. All right. So for the uh, for the for the map, uh, we actually implement all the put methods for you. So I can say put uh, back of tricks. Uh, live coding sucks. I can't even spell today. All right. <laughs> sucks. I want to spell sucks. All right. <laughs> all right. So that will give me a response. Whew. And then the best logger in the world, uh, print line, response. All right, we're almost done here. And that's it, right? I took a long way to get here. Uh, this could have been done in five minutes, but I, had to, I wanted to explain all the nitty gritties uh, and buy myself time to make sure everything works. Um, let's see if it works. I'll ask this, how many people think this would just work? Oh, I'm not even checking, never mind. What? <laughs> you still didn't raise your hand, I'm just saying. All right, so I'm gonna say uh, exact Java, and I should make the call. Ah, oh, there we go, awesome. So if I, whew, if I go to the, uh, the, the server side, you can see everything is being printed out. Um, and this is really, really easy. Um, if you ever need to, especially if you're dealing with distributed system where you wanna make sure uh, all of your clients are making the call uh, precisely and accurately, then you do need some kind of schema. In this case, it would be the IDL and we can generate all the client library for you. Uh, you never have to create your own client library ever again. And you can just start making codes very easily. Question in the back. Did you generate the client model? Did I generate that? I'm sorry? The client library. Yeah. Did you generate that before today? Or? Oh, no, no. It was actually generated uh, when I generated the server. It actually generated the client as well. Oh, so the server didn't do the shooting. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So if you are um, having consumers from different places, like different line of business, different project teams, or even just a different module, uh, you would actually share the photo file and you generate the client from the photo file. Okay? So that was the easy one. That was too easy. Um, let me show you something more interesting. Uh, the next thing I want to show is actually uh, bidirectional streaming. And I'm going to do this via a chat system, right? So you can chat. Um, we send chat messages, right? So we have a stream of incoming messages, and then whenever the server receives the message, I'm gonna broadcast it out to all of the connected client. And this is the proto file um, that defines a bidirectional bi streaming operation. Uh, so I have a chat service with a chat operation that takes in the messages and uh, send messages out. 
so the input is just chat message with the who was who sent it and uh, the message itself. And then I have this thing just to differentiate it from the message from the client. So I, I add another type called chat message from the server. Uh, the server also adds a timestamp in this case. As you can see, we, you can actually share portal files. So you can actually define message payloads in a portal file. You can share that, and then you can also import it into another portal file as well. So Google actually have a few standard ones. So you can, you can import the timestamp type, for example, and you can just use it. You give it a fully qualified name, then you're, you're, you're done, just like Java. Okay? okay, so we're gonna implement this very quickly. Uh, usually, uh, I rush it uh, in 10 minutes, but uh, we'll see how this works out today. Uh, Okay, so this is the, the signature, sorry, this is the, the stuff that's being generated for me, right? So we have the input base, just like before. We have the chat operation, just like before, uh, except that the signature is slightly different. To return anything to the client, you gotta go through the stream observer, so you gotta go through this response observer, right? So this response observer is what we need to use to send data to the client. Now, how does the server actually receive receive streaming data from the client. Well, it's also using a stream observer, but this is actually returned to the client. Now, this took me like a whole month to figure this out in my head, uh, but it actually makes a lot of sense, right? If you're doing this in memory, in the same JVM, right, you actually return an observer to the client, so the client can use it as the callback interface and start sending data to the server, right? So this is very similar semantically, but we're not dealing with any memory spaces here. It's just semantically, that's how it works. Uh, but behind the scenes, is, it's just another request over HTTP2, all right? So it's just an abstraction away from, for, for streaming, all right? So for this to work, for the chat server, first thing I need to do is to make sure uh, I collect, every time a client connects, I keep the client callback somewhere in a list, right? So if I need to broadcast to the client, I just iterate over observers, I can send all the data to all the connected client. To receive data from the client, I will return a new stream, stream observer implementation. And now I have this unnext method, and this is what happens when the client sends the server the message. This will be triggered, okay? So what happens when the server receives the message? Well, I'm going to iterate through all of the existing observers. I'm gonna say for each of the observers, I'm going to say unnext uh, and the, the message itself, okay, very easily done. I do have to specify it. So message from server, new builder, uh, build, right? And I can set the message to the message I just received. If I want to, I can set the timestamp. I'm not gonna do that today, all right? I'm going to assign this to the name uh, code, you know what? Here we go, message, there you go, okay? Pretty clear? So every time the client sends me a message, this will be triggered. I create the, the thing I want to send to every connected client, I iterate through it, and I send it via on next. If there's any error, any exceptions that's being thrown in between this, right? Uh, the on error will be called, right? So it's like the catch block. And uh, I'm gonna do what every good Java developer would do with the catch, uh, which is do nothing. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> No, 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 do something, right? In this case, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna say print stack trace, and uh, I'm gonna re remove myself from the, the reference. I'm gonna say response. Okay, cool. And if the client decides to disconnect gracefully, then uncompleted will be called, then I can also remove myself from my list as well. Okay? Whew. Oh my goodness, we're almost done here. Done, that's bidirectional streaming server. Uh, the only way for me to test it, of course, is to implement the, the client as well. So let me run this. Hold on a second, what's going on? Maven clean, uh, I'm gonna install, and accept Java, all right? So hopefully this works. Too much pressure. Yes, okay. All right, so it's listening on port 8080, right? So from the client side, uh, one thing I'm gonna say out loud up front is that um, every time people ask me, well, can you actually make gRPC calls from the browser? And the short answer is no. Uh, that's only because the browser, even though the browser supports HTTP2, it doesn't support fully specced HTTP2. What that means is uh, there are a few things in HTTP2 in the spec that is actually not implemented in the browser. And because of that, we cannot use gRPC. And specifically, gRPC requires the trailer 
In most of the HTTP stuff, you have the header, the body, but not the trailer. In gRPC, we actually need the trailer. So that is not implemented in the browser, so you cannot make gRPC code in the browser. So for the client, in this case, I'm going to use a JavaFX application. So I, I can do the JavaFX run. Wait a second, let me just make sure I clean this first. And do, oh wait. Oh man, and the package, there we go. Do a JavaFX run. Okay, so that's the, the app into calls, right? So I can say raise the name and I'm gonna say hello and uh, click on the send, it should send it to the server and everybody else should see it and we will all, all go wild and you know, just yell and cheer uh, when it actually works. Yeah, <laughs> when it actually works, not yet, not yet. <laughs> so close, so close, all right. If it actually works. <laughs> all right, so how do we do this? Well, first of all, same thing, we have the channel, we have the stub, you make the, uh, the call, chat. Do you remember what the server gets in the request? It gets the response, the response observer. Well, that's exactly what we're going to send over, okay? And what does the server return? An observer from the server? So I'm gonna call this the observer, uh, sorry, to server, I'm gonna say to server, okay? All right, so every time the server sends me a message, it will actually trigger this callback, the unnext. And here I can actually add my message to uh, my JavaFX uh, model. So I can say something like uh, string.format, um, the from and the message itself. And what is the payload? Let's see, get message.get from. And chat message from server, get message.get message, okay? Now because we're using JavaFX, and uh, in, in fact, uh, any of the UI-based application, you're gonna run this in a background thread of some sort. So I need to get these things into this uh, platform run later, okay? Um, on Arrow, I'm really gonna, not gonna do anything today. All right, do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and do nothing here to you. Okay, and that's it. That's really it to receive data from the server. Uh, to send data, what do we do? We use the, uh, the callback that we, we received to server, right? So what we can do is to, uh, oh, whenever, man, I cannot type today. Whenever somebody click on the send button, I'm gonna say uh, perform an action, oh, uh, like that. And I'm gonna say to server uh, on next, right? And can give it the message payload. And I can set whatever I want. So I'm gonna say, uh, let me see here, uh, new builder. I hate this builder thing. All right. So, <laughs> Sorry, oh damn it, it's recorded today. All right, <laughs> all right, here we go. It's immutable though, at least it's immutable. All right, so whenever you click a button, you, you set, you create this chat message and then you set the name, you set the from the, to the message itself and that should be it. Oh my goodness. All right, I'm done, thank you very much. All right, no, no, seriously, I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> don't wrong it. All right, let's see, let's see if it works. Oh man. I jinx it all the time. All right, so here we, here we go. So I'm gonna say Ray, and I'm gonna say, hello, toe run, toe jog. I spelled out right, right? Yeah, all right, send. All right, it actually works the first time. First time in my life too, it works the first time. <laughs> now, that was too easy that I need to show that it actually works with multiple clients as well. So I'm gonna start another instance here. Uh, my manager at Google, his name is Greg. So I'm gonna pretend to be Greg. <laughs> gonna say, good job, Ray. <laughs> <laughs> and of course that works. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Uh, a race? No? <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> I can go on this all night, all right. So you can see it's pretty easy to do, right? You saw the, the unitary request response, that's what everybody does. Uh, but if you really want something really high performance, you can actually use the streaming interfaces. In fact, uh, a Google, uh, Google Cloud Platform, if you ever use our messaging system, uh, we call it Google Cloud PubSub, uh, it's a high performance message uh, system uh, for topics and queues. Uh, we actually have two interfaces you can call. You can call over REST, which is slower, or you can use gRPC, right? Google actually uses gRPC as well. And the gRPC performance is um, multiple magnitudes faster than the REST performance. And many of our larger clients prefer gRPC clients uh, because they need the scale, they need the, the speed to process it, okay? Uh, there are a few things. Uh, there are many, many more things that we can touch on, but um, you know, I think my time is almost up. So just one, 
two more things, right? One is that um, we, we sell streaming. Uh, if you ever need to deal with um, microservices tracing, right, what you need, usually need to do is to pass like a, a header token, like a trace token in the header. You gotta propagate it all the way down. Um, in gRPC, we have metadata and context propagation, so we can pro propagate these metadata around. Um, more specifically though, this is really cool. If you ever build a microservices system in the back end where there is some kind of SLA, where the client or the caller doesn't want to wait forever, then you can actually set what we call a deadline. Okay. What that means is if I'm, I'm, I'm a caller, I'm calling service A, A is calling B, B is calling C. As a caller, I can say at maximum, I'm going to wait for one second. And service A has one second to complete. If it doesn't complete, then this call will be canceled. Then the, the, the service will be canceled, you can stop all the background processing, whatever, and you can move on. This deadline is actually propagated all the way downstream. So in this case, if service A took 30 milliseconds uh, to process whatever, and it makes the service call to B, well, everything that B can do and downstream will be one second minus 30 milliseconds, right? And then it gets propagated downstream again. So this, this, um, the, de the deadline is actually propagated all the way downstream. Uh, we actually do this sometimes where we don't want the client to wait forever or sometimes the result doesn't matter because we have so many servers doing this processing, uh, we can ignore some result, then we just set a deadline. And uh, if the, the service is too slow, we just move on, right? Uh, and there are a lot more to it. Uh, later I'm gonna show you my GitHub, you can learn more about load balancing, we can do server-side load balancing, client-side, there are different solutions for it. Um, you can use different service registries if you want to. Uh, there are ways for you to handle security. Um, and remember what I said about gRPC not usable by the browser? That's the current state. In the future, we hope that browsers will support gRPC too. But in the meantime, if you ever wanna make the call, you still have to make it with the JSON over HTTP call. So you can actually use a gateway. There's a gRPC gateway that can help you transco transcode the gRPC payload into RESTful payload, okay, and vice versa. Uh, you, you run this gateway yourself, or on Google Cloud, you can actually just run it as a service then everything uh, is good. You don't have to manage it yourself, okay? Um, so the reason why I'm here, uh, there are actually multiple reasons. Uh, number one is of course I wanna see people uh, trying it out to see if this is something useful for you. But most importantly though, is that um, I like to see people you know, participate in the community. Uh, this is an open source project. There's, there's a vibrant community um, online right now. Uh, you can actually participate and help us shape the direction of gRPC. Uh, if there are some use cases that we don't support, if there are some uh, specific things that you'd like to see done, uh, please, please, you know, go to the channels, go to the, the groups, and uh, engineers and me are there to, uh, to participate in the discussion, all right? And um, all my examples are actually on my GitHub as well. It's on gRPC Java demos, so you can find a lot of examples. And there are uh, one more thing. Uh, Salesforce has a really, really good uh, contribution library um, so they actually have Spring integration. I heard a lot of people using Spring and Spring Boot. So they actually have Spring Boot integration where you can just write the profile, you implement the service, and we'll, we'll do all the, um, the boilerplates behind the scenes for you as well. Um, the most, the, the coolest thing here though is the uh, GeoPolo C compiler. So you can actually use the Salesforce generator. Uh, they, they tell you how to use it, but if you use it, then we can actually generate uh, Java 8 uh, stops for you, right? So in addition to the async stop, the future stop, and the, um, the blocking stop, we can actually use completable features as well. Even cooler, they are working on a RxJava stop as well. So they actually generate RxJava 2 observables that you can just call, uh, and if you use that, you just make the RPC call over the wire to the remote service, and you just use RxJava behind the scenes uh, you don't even need to know gRPC at that moment. In RxJava 2, uh, there is the, uh, the concept of back pressure support, right? You need to handle back pressure. What that means is you don't want the producer to produce faster than what the client can consume. gRPC, surprisingly, actually is um, back pressure uh, native over the wire. So this is natively supported. So this works really, really well with RxJava 2. What that means is, in gRPC, uh, we have two levels of back pressure. One is at the HTTP2 buffer layer, so if you ex exhausted the HTTP2 buffer, then the producer would, would, would stop, right? The other thing is we can actually have per request 
uh, from the client where the client can say how much the client can re receive and the producer can start producing that many responses. Uh, so we can do two layers of blood pressure and that works really well with, uh, with RxJava, all right? So with all that being said, thank you very much for your time and um, thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Whew, that was tough. Uh, more drinks. <laughs> Any questions? There's usually some common questions, but uh, yes, question in the back. Any mm. questions before Colin? Colin. So the, the, the Java stops will work with Kotlin out of the box, uh, but if you want something more Kotlin native, uh, it's very possible to write a generator that generates Kotlin code. And if anybody is interested in doing that, I would welcome it, and also I would highly recommend doing it in the, in the Salesforce contribute uh, repository. The reason I say it is because the generation code in, in, in gRPC natively is written in C. And I have to say, this is recorded, right? It's very ugly. <laughs> 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 so anyways, um, if you use the Salesforce one, uh, if you see their generator, uh, you actually can use mustache uh, templating. So this is, how, this is how they actually generate Java A stop, and this is actually very, very straightforward. So you can use this and generate Kotlin stop, and you can contribute to this uh, repository. That would be really, really awesome to see, right? Uh, especially if the out-of-the-box um, uh, stops don't work for Kotlin, I would love to see it. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, in the back. Uh, required fields, right. So they don't have that in the definition, uh, you actually have to check it uh, in the application runtime. So you actually check it yourself in the application logic. What's that? Yeah. Um, let me go back to my thing. Just want to make sure I know what you're talking about. Oh, I see. Yeah, no. So you cannot specify the from as required field in the IDL. Right, but you have to check it in the application. So for example, um, I'm gonna go back to the, the unitary stuff. So here, let me just say something is, is required, right? So you have to do the check here, and then you have to return your own uh, error messages in this case, yeah. Uh, that brings me to error, actually. So if you ever wanna return an error, you use the response observer, right? You can say on um, error, and here, you can actually you know, give it any throwable. I don't recommend it because we don't actually serialize the exceptions for you. Okay, that's very important. So if you ever have your own business exceptions, we're not gonna serialize that and send it to the client. All right, so this is not uh, automatic. In RMI, it's pretty much automatic, but here it's not. Uh, we do have some canonical uh, statuses you can actually use. So just like in HTTP, you have the 404 not found, you have the 500 internal server error, uh, here we have similar thing. Uh, we have you know, already existed or um, not found or unavailable. So you can use some of these canonical statuses uh, as the exception to pass back. Uh, the reason why we do it this way is because we don't know who your consumers will be. Suppose you're writing uh, a public API and you have consumers that's calling this, you don't necessarily want your internal business arrows to be propagated all the way to the client because that could include information you don't want to, you know, um, propagate to the outside of your company. So your error handling has to be explicit in this case. All right, does that help? All right, any other questions? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I gotcha. Um, I don't know, I don't think there's a way to generate it. Um, at least I don't know any public generator to do that. Um, most of the cases what I've seen is that uh, they just document directly in the photo, right? Because you, you can see the photo, this is the documentation on what uh, things should be doing. You can add in comments, um, and you can just document it this way. Um, I'm pretty sure though there, there must be some community project out there that's you know, trying to generate better looking uh, documents. Um, I'm just not aware of it myself at this moment, yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is some. Cannot point to a name at this moment. Okay. So if one side sends fields that the other side doesn't have, is IDL definition right. just ignored, or does that cause a problem? Um, if I recall correctly, it's just ignored. So, so in the protofile, 
uh, the way to maintain backwards compatibility is actually, uh, well, easiest one is actually not remove anything. Or in this case, it's really just not reuse any of the tags that you already used before. So suppose you remove one in this case, you don't ever want to use one again because uh, if somebody sends one in, it could be mapped to a different field. You can actually reserve um, the one by using the reserve keyword. So you would never use one again in this case. And you can also comment in documentation like never use this again, right? So you can, you can potentially comment this out. Okay, yeah. Um, in most cases, uh, versioning, it depends on how you want to version your microservices. Um, you know, in, in Google, we don't really, like, unless it's like a big jump, right, we, we typically keep all the proto uh, backwards compatible, right? It's, it's very, very doable. If it's a public API, then I would highly recommend you um, version things, and the way you version is via the package name. So you can say this is the V1 uh, service or this is a V2 service. Um, you can do that, okay. Any other questions? Yeah? So One more. Yeah, 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 definitely. So uh, let me see here. So I can define another message. I don't know uh, account, uh, a, like a stream uh, number, account number or ID, whatever, uh, equal to one. Then I can do account, account, uh, just like that, right? Yeah. Um, now one thing I have to say though, there's no inheritance, right? So these messages. Uh, you cannot inherit from another message. The way you do it is by using composition. Uh, there are other keywords, such as uh, you can do something like uh, one-off or uh, any-off. And this is a way for you to uh, be able to say, well, this, like a union type almost. So you can say this, this field can be one-off blah or something else. Okay. Cool, awesome. Um, that depends. Um, at the low load, um, it's just one, yeah, yeah. But um, as you're exhausting the pool, they will actually create more, yeah. What happens to pending requests if that socket gets lost? Um, the pen, oh, I see, gotcha. It should, it either gets, it should probably re uh, receive an error in this case. Okay. Yeah, you will actually receive an error, yeah. yeah. So it's not like buffer for you, yeah. So if there's any, connection errors, whatever, you will just get the exception. Uh, or in this case, in the callback function, you just get the on error, which you do nothing about. Just kidding, no, you, you do something <laughs> to handle it. Um, if you're interested in the type of uh, errors you can get, uh, let me just go to my GitHub very quickly. Satanism, uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. gRPC Java. So I have a lot of examples here, and one of them is the error handling example. Um, and you can actually see what happens on the server. You can actually see what does the client actually catch. All right, so let me see here. Error service info, All right? So it actually has quite a few different uh, error cases. And you can go to the client side to see what's actually caught. Okay. Uh, what are the examples I have here? Um, low balancing is the most frequently asked example and I got it uh, right here. So I have low balancing example if you're running Kubernetes, for example. Uh, which is something you should be aware of. One thing I should point out in that case, right? Because we do try to um, uh, multiplex over a single channel, over a single connection, what that means is when you are low balancing the request, this become a little bit uh, different from what you are accustomed to. In low balancers, we have multiple types, right? We have L4 or L7. L4 will be a network low balancer, L7 will be per request. Typically, in a regular HTTP 1 implementation, every time you make a call, it could potentially be a new request. So it's actually very easy to use an L4 load balancer. What L4 does is every time you have a new connection, you will establish the connection, it will point you to a node, and the connection will be persisted for almost forever until the connection is uh, closed. In gRPC, because we just use potentially just one connection that's persisted for the long term, um, once you establish this connection, every request you make is gonna be going to exactly the same server, okay? So that, that could be troublesome for some people, and so for that reason, uh, you may actually wanna consider L7 load balancing. And there are not that many L7 load balancers for HTTP2, you only have a few options. Uh, Linkerd is one, and Envoy is another. 
Uh, and also, uh, th there will be an engine X upstream that has HTTP2 support. Okay. The free ones. Yeah, the free ones, yeah. Uh, ELB, I'm not sure. Oh, AOB. Oh, oh, I see. ELB, I'm not not uh, familiar with. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I need to take a look at it. Yeah. You should take it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I'm not familiar with the uh, AWS uh, ELB. Is that is that new? Uh, yeah, 14 months ago. Okay. Okay. That's cool. All right. I see. Yeah. AOB, right? AOB. Okay. Oh, interesting, interesting. Yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> I see, very cool. Yeah, it's good to know. <laughs> very cool. Uh, any other questions? No? All right, cool. Nice. Thank you. Drinks. <laughs> <laughs>